the show. I'm Leslie Choice. My guest today is Larry Gaudette, who is the author of Safe Haven, The Possibility of Sanctuary in an Unsafe World. Good to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here, Leslie. Now, this is an autobiographical book, and why was this subject so important to you? Um, I'd like to think that, uh, as a writer, that uh, some days I like to think that I'm in possession of a really sophisticated view of reality. And uh, I thought that uh, Sanctuary would be an interesting thing to write about because it has so many dimensions as a, I guess, a fusion of architecture, um, ethics, and religion. It just seemed like a really big topic. And it's also the grand history of humanitarian intervention and, and, and human creativity and finding ways to protect new classes of victims. And of course, it's also about solitude. It seemed like a really big topic. But uh, why? I think I have to come back to a lot humbler um, sort of reasons. Uh, maybe it's just because I had become a dad on one hand, and I was interested in the idea of protection and fear and the relationship to it. Um, so um, I think there are probably more humble reasons than the, the, than the writer's ego at stake. Yeah, well, there you, you sort of have that high-minded philosophical notion. But it, as I'm think, you know, reflecting on having read the book, it's, it's really very down to earth, you know, because it's about you and your, uh, and your family down on the south shore of Nova Scotia. Yeah, old-fashioned words like love and friendship and the family in motion and how you protect it uh, is uh, certainly probably the deeper motivation and probably the only one that, uh, that I'm really comfortable is, is certain. Okay, makes sense to me. Now, do you think most people feel that it is an unsafe world that we live in? Yeah, and I think some, have, some folks have legitimate reasons for feeling it's an unsafe world because we know that the planet is just uh, is an unsafe place. I mean, and we're filled with those images every day. I think in our own particularly privileged culture, I would argue that uh, fear and the, how it metastasizes within us, I think people feel also unnaturally afraid. And that is, I think, partially, I think a decadent response in a privileged society. We're afraid of everything. And uh, uh, that's the one thing that I think holds us all together. So what are, the some, what are some of the places where we go looking for safety, for sanctuary? Well, you know, I think that there is the scenario. I think we all sort of like to identify a physical place, you know, the, you know, the lonely beach, um, you know, the monastery on the side of the hill. Uh, there are, you know, iconic places we like to go. I think um, ultimately, though, we're looking for those, we look at those places as a way to come back to uh, the, the inner place that we're looking for on the one hand, in other words, to find sanctuary somehow, some peace with ourselves, and also within the web of folks that are important in our lives, I think. Uh, I think that's what we're ultimately looking for, although sometimes it's, I think that's a displaced feeling and we, we push it onto objects like beaches and houses and, and so on. Okay, so where did you personally go looking for your safe haven? Well, naturally, I made all the obvious mistakes. I, I focused on buying a piece of property and building a house by the land. And if I thought I moved out there, I would find some peace and some solitude. And there certainly there was a measure of adventure in doing that. Uh, but uh, even as I was pushing in that direction, um, I was forced on a med into a meditation of really, what is it that gives me peace? And, uh, and it is, in fact, friendship and love and family, the web of people who are important in my life. Okay, now tell me a little bit about this location, Foggy Cove. I know you've changed the name here to uh, protect the innocent or guilty, but, um, and we won't reveal the real place. But uh, what's it like there at Foggy Cove? You know, what I wanted to do, and this is you know, a slightly superficial way of looking at why you want to write a book, I wanted to do for Nova Scotia Fog what Peter Mayle did for, uh, for Golden Provincial Sunlight, and maybe we could have called this book Room with No View or something. Oh, I see. But okay. you know, there's something quite beautiful about the North Atlantic coast. Leslie, I'm sure you know that. Uh, you know, there are... There's granite cliffs and there's long, you know, sandy beaches, and there's a sense of being one with the loneliness of the place, and uh, also the cultural environment, the echoes of my own particular past. Uh, I grew up uh, in part on the sea, uh, uh, from fishing family roots, so to be connected to that kind of, you know, uh, experience on the edge of the world seemed like a very, you know, rich place to uh, indulge a sanctuary fantasy, if you want to call it that. And how did you end up at that particular location? Um, I'd, I'd been coming to Nova Scotia for a long time. I, I'd gone to university at Dalhousie, and um, um, I was just looking for a, um, a tension-free experience by the sea in Nova Scotia, because I have family in Prince Edward Island. I just wanted to sort of get back to being along the shores of, of, of a beautiful coastline, and I discovered this place, Foggy Cove, the mythical Foggy Cove, by accident, and then it became a compulsion. Uh, there are beautiful places along the south shore of Nova Scotia that, uh, that I feel very drawn to. Your, your other life is in Toronto? Yeah, I, I live like an accelerated nomad. I, I've kind of, like a lot of people, uh, my body seems to be moving ahead of me. 
so you know, my, my wife and, and uh, my children, our children and I, we, we have a, a, little, a little place in Toronto and uh, we have a place in Nova Scotia and we struggle to get between them and stay whole. What kind of research did you do looking into how other cultures view sanctuary? Um, you know, I started this in a very solemn and sober way. I was going to research everything. You know, so you start looking into the history of sanctuary and basically you come up against the idea that you're dealing with the history of human knowledge. So it's instantly overwhelming. And uh, you realize that not only are you unqualified to write a book about religious sanctuary or sanctuary, no one else is because it's effectively a billion pins on, billion angels on, on each of a billion pins to write it uh, about sanctuary. But uh, I, I had an early interest in, in, in Greek temple architecture. Um, you know, the, the ruined uh, skeletal things on the, on the, on the Greek landscape, and uh, I was drawn to that from, you know, from my early 20s, and, um, and I always found something interesting in looking at temple architecture. So I began, I guess, what you might call a, a cross-cultural look at those sorts of um, religious sanctuaries. So I did a fair bit of book research. I traveled a couple of places, and uh, like a lot of writers, I guess you kind of cut corners with your research, trying to find a way to appear to be more comprehensive than you actually are. Uh, we're going to take a short break right now. We'll be back with Larry Gaudet right after this. If you'd like more information about this or any of the programs we produce at Mount St. Vincent University, call us or email. We welcome your comments. to the show, my guess is Larry Gaudet. Is, is um, Shanks Roy really something more psychological than real? Yeah, I think there are a number of um, arrival points to sanctuary, you know, uh, and some are psychological, you know, in the sense of how your mind works. Some is, for lack of a, a better term, almost spiritual in the sense of you're not sure why you're drawn to it, but you, you know you're drawn to something that feels that's beyond your, your level of knowledge, you know, like... Uh, I was drawn to the coast of Nova Scotia because I could see the sky, the black sky at, at night, and it felt like you're involved in something bigger than, than, than human reality. Um, so but to your main question, I, I think, yes, I think that's probably the lesson I learned more than anything else. This book ends with um, my family. Uh, we're all in a car together driving back into the fog. And uh, I think it's very much a kind of uh, human construct sanctuary as much as possible. I think, you know, all these places like monasteries and people go there to kind of re-engineer their, their insides, you know, and, and their brain and, and, and their psychology. So I th think it's, it's more psychological and spiritual than anything else. Did you find it there? Did you find this peaceful sanctuary there at your home? Um, I think, you know, in a self-deprecating way, I mean, I, I describe in the book a kind of psychological mini breakdown in, in terms of, because I arrived at certain preconceived notions, but I discovered that when you put yourself in, under sanctuary conditions, you're forced into a little meditation on, on the self. You have to sort of look at yourself probably with more um, honesty if you're going to go down that road of saying, uh, I'm in the sanctuary, so what now? So the, the look I had of myself wasn't as, uh, as, as, uh, as fun as I thought it would be. You know, I thought I could control the subject matter, but I was forced to kind of look at the, at the condition of my life, and um, while I'm a very fortunate person, um, um, how I construct myself as an adult, uh, you know, left much to be desired. I, you know, I discovered I was a bit of a ghost of a person. I was moving too fast. I was fragmented in little pieces. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I say that because uh, I don't think, I, I, not that it's a unique experience. I was more interested in, 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 in understanding how we all feel. Uh, that, that would seem to be more of a writer's task than an individual's task. So the writer putting the book together was looking at the, at the conditions that... Uh, in, our, in a contemporary society. And, uh, and that's what I found in the sanctuary, that there, there's a lot of work to do to try to stay whole. And uh, I wasn't fully whole. So this required quite a bit of self-examination. And since you're the writer writing the book, you're kind of you know, displaying yourself and your life and your fears and everything there on the page. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of avenues for indulgence there that one needs to be real careful of. And I'm not so sure that you, know, you always succeed you know, in, in staying on the proper side of that line. But, uh, I think if there's a fundamental question that to me the moral edge of the book is how do we determine how to engage properly with the world in, in the big swirl? You know, um, it seems to me that so much of modern life is about looking at things and not doing. It's about speculating and not experiencing. It's about living as, as an audience member and not a citizen. And uh, 
I really wonder if we know our own minds anymore. You know? So um, that to me is, if you're going to write about sanctuary, especially coming from the privileged position that I come from in, in, in the world, uh, you need to find some moral angle. Otherwise, it really is just you in the false sanctuary in the gated community talking to yourself. And that's, uh, I don't think writers should do things like that if they can avoid it. Seems like it rained a whole lot that summer we spent down there. <laughs> yeah, we had, a, we had a, a, some kind of tsunami-like experiences out there, but I have to tell you, uh, uh, my father-in-law wasn't that impressed because he said, no, 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 people have these feelings about Nova Scotia that it's always raining out here. No, we can't, we can't be doing that. It's bad marketing. Um, but no, every experience, every experience out there in the, uh, on, on the edge of the world out there, you know, fog, rain, uh, sunshine, um, sunsets and dawns, they're, they're all fundamentally beautiful. And I see it in my children. Um, if I don't so much see it in myself any longer, it, except as memory, I see that how that, the natural environment out there, so-called, has really enriched them. And they're, they're, still, they're still little guys, but I can see when they're out there how it, they, they just soak the stuff up and, uh, and it has a really good effect on them. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a short break right now. We'll be back with Larry Budette right after this. If you'd like more information about this or any of the programs we produce at Mount St. Vincent University, call us or email. We welcome your comments. And welcome back to the show. My guest today is Larry Godet, and we're talking about his book, Safe Haven, and his experiences in a small community on the south shore of Nova Scotia, but also about the idea of sanctuary. Now, you mentioned several key people in your book. One of them is the architect Brian McKay Lyons. Can you speak a bit about his uh, philosophy of architecture and what his buildings are like near where you were living? You know, Brian's a bit of a, a creative mentor you know, to me in some ways. Um, you know, he's an Acadian artist. Uh, you know, he's a Nova Scotian who could have gone off. He was talented enough to leave and move off to any of the great metropolises uh, of the planet where architectural work is undertaken by great firms. But he decided to stay in Nova Scotia and to kind of look at the, at the building traditions of the, of, of the province and the region and to celebrate them and transform them and make them more contemporary, to bring the past, heave the past into the future. Uh, do you take that into your writing, doing something similar to his philosophy? Yes, it's a bit more hidden, obviously, because I, I don't. I'm not working with concrete and, and studs, but I'm working with the inter internal concrete and studs. And uh, in this book, I had an opportunity, which I hadn't done before, was to kind of look at myself as uh, as an Acadian and what that would mean in a contemporary context. I wanted to write a contemporary Acadian roots tale, and that was very interesting for me. I'm not particularly drawn to going to jamborees and hanging around with the, you know. Um, Trailer Hitch comrades, you know, wearing the battle uniforms and cooking up the old recipes. But I am interested in what it means to be a contemporary Acadian, to live on the move, uh, to be able to carry multiple identities and not to be trapped into a rigid identity, not either or. You're, you're kind of something guerrilla-like and provisional about it. And it's also, being an Acadian, um, I think there's a sense of being an exile culture and trying to find, you know, a home. I find that interesting. So to be able to fall into that tradition, you know, is kind of... Uh, uh, and to honor it in, in, a, in my own small way is, uh, uh, I guess, in a small way is what Brian's doing. It. You know, uh, I mean, he's farther along the, the career path or the, let's call it the achievement path, I, I like to say, because he's got a great body of work. Tell me a bit more about the, the Acadian side of you. I was going to ask you about this. Um, you know, how much has that shaped you? How much of your identity is tied in with being an Acadian? Well, I, first of all, I came to it fairly late, the idea that I was even an Acadian, which says something a little bit about the educational system in this country. Um, uh, or actually my lack of curiosity as well. Um, but I would say that uh, I'm not drawn to the Acadian story as one that I need to put the flag in the ground to say, you know, we need to carve out a new country for ourselves. Um, um, I was interested in it because my own family, uh, I discovered that my own family had been fairly rootless. They had grown up by the sea in a very marginalized environment as Acadians, French Acadians in Prince Edward Island. And I realized that there was a dimension of that that was systemic and oppressive that they had lacked all the opportunities, I think, of being able to find a way in the, uh, in the culture of the Maritimes. And so often they were on the road. So my parents went on the road and they moved to Quebec, but they never really fit in because they were weirdly anglicized Acadians and they weren't pure land Quebecois enough. So we'd been on the road for a long time, so I became very interested in that idea of, of being able to sort of identify with that sense of rootlessness and, and make it real, make it 21st century, if you want to call it. That sounds a bit funny, but... Uh, so I was interested from that point of view. Um, 
having the multiple identities and uh, tapping into it a little bit. Right. If you go back to that time period of, of the exile in the 18th century, the English soldiers driving out the uh, driving the Acadians away from Nova Scotia. Why do you think so many of them came back? Why do you think those Acadians so many found their way back to here? Um, well, you read Pelagie, you know, you read, uh, you know, there's this romantic idea that you're drawn to the place that you're born, you know, or maybe you don't know any, any better, or maybe there's a sense of entitlement, something's been taken away from you. I like to say about this book, and it's a slightly trivial thing to say, but, uh, you know, they kicked us out in the, 16th, in the 1750s, I'm back, I feel like Freddie, you know, on Friday the 13th, he's back, yeah, yeah. but uh, I don't feel any of that kind of anger at all I don't, about that sort of, I don't identify with that. But it's a very strong, rich kind of culture. I, did you ever fantasize about an alternate history for the Maritimes whereby it had become dominated, let's say, by Acadian culture? I mean, if a couple of little twists of history and that could have happened, this would have been a very, very different place. Yeah, I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by reversing the sense of loss because you, you want to imagine how many billions of an ocean of tears that, that, weren't, uh, that didn't fall here in Nova Scotia from Acadians, or the millions of hours of laughter that didn't occur, or the families that didn't get formed, or the, or the culture that didn't take off. Uh, you know, writers play these kind of parlor games with themselves. They are interested in, in the great alternative histories, that, the things that never occurred. And uh, it helps to put into proportion the sense of loss, I think, the sense of cultural loss, and to kind of uh, qualify it, I guess. And here you are writing about safe haven, of course, which is the protected place where people cannot come in and boot you out of there and send you off into exile. It's all kind of swirling around there. Um, how much does the fact that you have children play into this interest of finding the safety in the world? You mentioned that just briefly. How old were your, uh, your, your sons there when you're writing about? Um, I like the idea that uh, as a dad, it sort of cuts through all the, the BS that uh, the writerly kind of mechanics that go on your head while you do certain kinds of things. Uh, definitely as, as a dad, uh, you know, I'm probably like a lot of fathers, I'm, I have my, my eyes always open for any source of danger no matter how remote. There's a super, super computer going on in my head. I'm not so sure that's healthy all the time. I grew up feral. I, I was swimming in harbors and, and hunting at, at, at eight. I had, you know, guns and I had fishing rods and I I would, I'd go off for, not for days, but I, you know, if I came back home alive, my parents are generally happy, you know, when we live uh, on the ocean. Now, you know, basically I'm thinking, well, how do we put the GPS chip into my kid's head, you know? Maybe we should just have a webcam on them constantly with a satellite. So uh, there's something kind of weird about all that sort of shifting, shift in, um, in, in obsessional kind of focus on safety and danger. And uh, that's part of what I try to deal with in, in a way. I'd like to be a bit more distant from that, from that psychology, and I don't know if it's me or how much of it is me and how much are the social conditions around us that, uh, that nurture this sense of fear. Of course, and it's very much a product of our times. Uh, we're going to take another short break and be back with Larry Godet right after this. If you'd like more information about this or any of the programs we produce at Mount St. Vincent University, call us or email. We welcome your comments. back to the show. My guess is Larry Gaudet. Um, there was a little detail somewhere in your book I really wanted to ask you about. It had to do with architecture. We'll j jump back to that for a minute. That um, in days gone by, people were building their houses on a, a north-south axis. And I live in a 200-year-old house, and as I was reading your book in that 200-year-old house, I go, oh, yes, my house is exactly that. Did you ever figure out what that was about? Why well, it was that? a conversation I had with Brian McKay Lyons in the book, and he was telling me, he said, look at this. Brian has a, a property where there's lots of archaeological properties, out in, uh, archaeological sites. And he said, to settlers here, they, they aligned all their houses on the north-south axis. And I said, well, why? And he came back and said, uh, well, maybe they want to leave a message to the future. You know, they want to be remembered long after they turn to ashes. So there's something weird about that formalization of, of your domestic arrangements. Say, so why are you doing it? So, but what was the message? The message that they were there, they want to be remembered. Oh, I see. Okay. That's a, that was unique. Now, you dip into your past in the book as well, uh, write about travels in Greece and Italy. What did you find there in regards to the idea of sanctuary? I grew up in Montreal in a Greek neighborhood. I spent a lot of time in, in a working class neighborhood called Park Extension. And it was, I grew up thinking in part that I was Greek because it was highly Greek at the time. And so for me to go to Greece uh, and falling in love with, uh, I went to Greece on my honeymoon. But for the first time, I also went to see the great temples. And to see them in, that, in their ruined state spoke to something very, very deep inside me. 
you know, I'd seen reconstructions of the Parthenon. It just looked like Washington, D.C. in a lot of ways. But when I see the ruined Parthenon or, uh, you know, other, other temples like that all over the, the country, it, I, I felt like I was looking through a zipper or something in, into, into the great sky. It felt like a really beautiful quasi-mystical experience, if I can call it that. What's this term you use in your book called uh, sanctuary porn, as in pornography? What do you mean by that? Well, I've been upbraided for using that term by a number of folks who think, who, who believe, and perhaps rightly so, that I have uh, uh, satirically examined the genre of books where people go on journeys to find enlightenment. And, I mean, you know, guy buys land in the countryside and uh, goes out there, discovers he's twice as profound as he thinks he is, or half as profound as it was in my case. Uh, or they go to the monastery, or, you know, or they go on the pilgrimage on, you know, and they walk on their knees. And uh, I love those books. I, I love all those books of journeys and uh, things like that. What, what, the books I call sanctuary porn is both lighthearted because they just, you seem to consume them like very rapidly. You know, I think I'll ask you to pick up your book there and read a, a short excerpt from it. This is uh, Larry Gaudet who's going to read from his book called Safe Haven. Yeah, I want to read just a very small segment about why we, re why we crave solitude. Why crave solitude? Because we can't hear ourselves think, that's why. The clatter and billboards of the metropolis, the gossip and grudges of the small town, the latest news of the Civil War or terrorist tragedy, the gleam of impatient or unsatisfied lust in a lover's eye, all these things and so many others get in the way of us, make a mockery of us. Too often we can't figure out what really matters in life because our signal to noise ratio is all out of whack. We retreat in the belief that apartness or aloneness is required to clear our heads, get a better perspective, shed a dying skin, separate what's pr profound from the superficial, and we fool ourselves that making this, dis this distinction is possible. We decamp into otherworldly spaces and hide in shacks to get in touch with whatever we desire to be or want to create or need to avoid in order to stay sane. We go places to neutralize the unhappy voices and unmentionable dreams in our heads by experiencing the beauty of the howling wind or the sky reflecting light from a rising sun or a falling rain. And we have our tricks to go inward, yoga, meditation, a hot bath, long walks, a walk on the wild side, embrace to protect or nurture something in ourselves, a connection to a god or landscape, the hunger to apprehend the shades of meaning in a memory, a relationship, a work of art, an illness. There's even the perverse allure of getting some distance from those we love, if only to remind ourselves, idiots that we are, how much we appreciate them in our lives after all. Uh, Larry Goodett, thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here, Leslie. And thank you for watching. I'm Leslie Choice. I'll see you again next time.